Well, first of all, it's just a pleasure to be here because really some of my closest friends in the whole world, from all over the world, are sitting right here in this room. And to be here with friends and talking with friends is the best part of being an academic. You know, the academic life is filled with intellectual delights and friendship delights. And so I just want to say hello to all my friends out there, including these two incredible women in front here. First, I had to thank Professor Sarah Franklin, who I have to say just is a truly dynamic, incredible force in this world of reproductive studies as you're defining it. Um, it brings together reproductive sociology, reproductive anthropology, and ethics and other things into this it's not a center, but it's a, a repro hub called Cambridge ReproSoc, or Repro Reproductive Sociology. There is nothing else like it in the whole world. It is the only place where scholars working on reproduction can come together in an intellectual, collegial group. And it's fantastic. And Sarah, we all owe a huge round of applause to you for doing this. It's an amazing Thank you, dear Dr. Zainab Curtin, who I have to say was there at the very beginning of this work that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, she was the one who read a very drafty draft of the introduction during a very difficult summer when I was recovering from an immobilizing foot surgery. And I was not feeling very you know, optimistic, and so she read it and she was sort of cheering me on, saying, yes, you know, keep going. She liked the repro lexicon that I'm going to be introducing today. So I've had the delight of working with Zainab in very supportive and wonderful ways too. So, really amazing group of people here at Cambridge Re ReproSoc. The topic of my lecture today is what I call repro travel, or the traveling of infertile people across national borders in the search of in vitro fertilization, or IVF. This phenomenon has usually been called reproductive tourism, fertility tourism, or more clinically, cross-border reproductive care, or CBRC. But in my own work, I've now abandoned all of those terms out of respect for the many <coughs> infertile couples that I've worked with who thoroughly critique the term reproductive tourism, saying that travel for IVF is no holiday and that the term tourism sounds gimmicky, making a mockery of their suffering. Yes, they are travelers, but they do not consider themselves to be tourists, even in the global tourist hub of Dubai, which is the locus of my own research and what I'm going to be talking about today. So given these potent critiques of the very language that we're using to describe reproductive mobility in the 21st century, part of my lecture today will be devoted to what I call a repro lexicon, a conceptual vocabulary with which to think about reproduction and global flows of repro travelers and their body parts. I also want to take you into the heart of Dubai, which is fashioning itself as what I call a global repro hub. I want to talk about Dubai's medical cosmopolitanism, which has made the global landscape of repro travel into Dubai possible. So I'm going to show slides, and I know I'm tall, I'm standing in front of the slides. I'm going to sit down and use the computer if that's okay. You can move the podium over. Do you want me to? Yeah, well, I'll stand. Because I like my top, so. <laughs> it's gold, just like Dubai. <laughs> I think that's our Is that better? Yeah, I noticed that um, it was walking. So good. So, gonna talk here. so let's use this. Is it okay? Yeah. Okay. So, a clinic called Conceive. In a converted showroom, across from a shopping mall, on the periphery of a busy traffic circle, located on the very border of the neighboring Emirates of Dubai and Sharjah, United Arab Emirates, sits a clinic called Conceive. From the outside, the clinic is nondescript. Tinted showroom windows block the typically intense sun and increase patients' privacy. The clinic's sign provides the only hint of what occurs within, as the highlighted O in Conceive resembles an oocyte being penetrated by a single spermatozoan. The modest facade of this edifice belies the interior, for Conceive is a bustling global IVF clinic, catering to infertile couples from five continents and nearly one-third of the world's nations. At Conceive, Muslim patients from Pakistan meet with Hindu physicians from India, are cared for by Catholic nurses from the Philippines, have their embryos handled by Greek Orthodox embryologists, and receive follow-up instructions from two African clinicians, both Muslims, one from the Sudan and, one, and the other from Somalia. At the clinic entrance, 
Infertile Arabs, Europeans, Africans, and South Asians are greeted by a smiling receptionist, as well as by photographs of the rulers of the Emirates, which are prominently displayed in most businesses and in hotels and other places, clinics, hospitals across the country. So in this multi-ethnic, multi-religious clinic, the clinical staff mingle across cultural divides with friendships formed after many years of working together. The patient population is similarly diverse and multi-sectarian. Although a glass wall is intended to separate the men and the women in the waiting area, infertile couples from South Asia, Europe, North America, Australia, and Arab nations interact with each other across continental and gender divides, effectively ignoring the gender segregation instructions, which are printed in English. After all, English is the common language of the Emirates where Arabic-speaking Emirati locals, as they're often called, are outnumbered eight to one. As a result, all 22 clinic staff members at Conceive speak English, along with a variety of other languages, the most common of which are Arabic, Hindi, Tagalog, and Urdu. <clears throat> Opened on July 4th, 2004, which happened to coincide with America's Independence Day, Conceive is the brainchild of this man, Dr. Pankaj Srivastava, the clinic's physician director who's widely revered as the father of IVF in the UAE. <clears throat> Born in India and educated in the UK, Dr. Pankaj is part of a generation of European-trained gynecologists who began to serve as traveling IVF troubadours, taking the art of assisted conception to other countries around the globe. <coughs> At the beginning of the 1990s, the Dubai Health Authority proposed to start its own IVF unit in the local government hospital, where Emiratis, as well as expatriates, could receive affordable infertility care. In May 1991, the Dubai Gynecology and Fertility Center was opened at the government-run Rashid Hospital. Dr. Pankaj was asked to serve as the clinic's deputy director, a position that he held until 2004. However, by the turn of the new millennium, the global landscape of reproductive medicine had begun to change. Across the Middle East, an IVF boom was occurring, with private IVF clinics opening in cities such as Beirut, Cairo, Casablanca, Damascus, Istanbul, Riyadh, Tehran, and Tunis. The Emirates was not immune to this technological globalization, nor to the concomitant privatization of most Middle Eastern medical services. So by 2005, the, UA, the UAE hosted seven IVF clinics, five of them private facilities. By 2012, that number had increased to 14, 12 of them privately owned. And by 2015, that number had increased to 20. Dr. Pankaj was attracted by the promise and potential of running a private IVF clinic. With the encouragement of one of his patients, an infertile Emirati businessman, who volunteered to invest his own money and serve as the required local sponsor, Dr. Pankaj decided to open a private clinic on the Dubai Sharjah border. He and his Emirati business partner rented an empty showroom and proceeded to create Conceive from scratch. Although neither the largest nor the smallest clinic in the UAE, indeed the Middle East hosts IVF clinics ranging from huge high-rise private hospital complexes in places like Amman and Abu Dhabi to tiny cramped clinics tucked into the back alleys of Beirut and Cairo, Conceive can be fairly described as, as bright and spacious. Perhaps because of the consistent sunlight, as well as the high ceilings of the former showroom, Conceive has a sunny feel made even brighter by the numerous framed baby photos adorning the clinic's hallways. So last month in September, I returned to the clinic for a follow-up visit. It was clear that Conceive was continuing to serve <coughs> hundreds of patients who were coming from Asia, Africa, other parts of the Middle East, and Europe. Wearing different national garb, speaking softly in different tongues, having traveled from vastly different geographical locations, these infertile patients had nonetheless found Conceive and were there on a bright Friday morning, the beginning of the Emirates weekend, to make their test tube babies. <clears throat> Conceive, I would argue, is a stunningly cosmopolitan IVF clinic. With more than 20 staff members hailing from the Middle East, Africa, South and Southeast Asia, and Western Europe, Conceive practices a kind of global gynecology, making infertile patients from abroad feel comfortable with the high quality of its IVF services and with its multicultural patient care, which can be delivered by co-nationals in Arabic, Hindi, Urdu, and several other languages. 
In the Middle East as a whole, the practice of global gynecology in a cosmopolitan clinic is unusual, perhaps even unique. Most clinics and hospitals in other Arab countries are staffed by local Arab physicians who treat mostly <coughs> Arab IVF patients. So for example, during my previous study in Beirut, reproductive travelers were coming, but they were overwhelmingly hailing from two other near, eight neighboring Arab countries, namely Syria and Palestine, and to a much lesser extent, Egypt and the Arab Gulf. In contrast, Conceive provided a veritable object lesson in globalization. During the course of my research at Conceive, I was able to track the comings and goings of a diverse group of nearly 220 repro travelers from exactly 50 countries. Many of these repro travelers were Arab, but most were not. <clears throat> and so to use the words of the anthropologist George Marcus, Conceive provided a multi-sided sensibility within a strategically situated single-site ethnography. That is, within this single clinic, both patients and practitioners were aware of coming together across vast cultural divides, thereby becoming part of something global in the enactment of a particular form of reproductive medicine. Their explicit attempts to overcome multiple differences, to be open to and tolerant of medical care delivered across geographic, ethnic, linguistic, religious, <coughs> political, economic, gender, and cultural boundaries provides a case study in what I would like to call medical cosmopolitanism. Conceive, I would argue, provides an example par excellence of 21st century medical cosmopolitanism, a feature of healthcare delivery in the new millennium in a small but growing number of global hubs around the world. <clears throat> so what do I mean by medical cosmopolitanism? This term has two distinct but related meanings. First, it entails the concept of cosmopolitan medicine, a term that was originally used to signify the production of Western-based biomedicine and its rapid global spread. The second meaning is related to the concept of cultural cosmopolitanism, or the coming together of people from many different nations at the point of medical consumption, so the actual delivery of clinical care. Medical cosmopolitanism, as I'm using it, signifies this double entendre of the global production and consumption of Western techno-scientific medicine <laughs> in places where the outlook of both practitioners and patients is self-consciously cosmopolitan in nature. And it's useful to examine, I think, the original term cosmopolitan medicine, which although rarely invoked today, is still quite useful for thinking about 21st century medical cosmopolitanism. And in addition, it's important to understand how recent theories of cultural cosmopolitanism relate to the delivery and consumption of medical care in the emerging cosmopolitan capitals of the world, of which Dubai, with its healthcare city that we're going to see, is the Middle East's most salient example. <clears throat> so cosmopolitan medicine. <coughs> the physician anthropologist Frederick Dunn, who was one of my very dear mentors at University of California, San Francisco, and who passed away two years ago, I had to find the genealogy of this term, cosmopolitan medicine, and it was Fred Dunn, my mentor. Mm -hmm. In 1976, he wrote a piece in a, journal, in a book by Charles Leslie called Asian Medical Systems, where he coined the term cosmopolitan medicine. And he used it to refer to what was then being called modern scientific or Western medicine. And Dunn believed that those terms, which are often used in juxtaposition to indigenous, local, or traditional medicine, created an implicitly biased dualism. <clears throat> as he pointed out, traditional medical systems, such as Ayurveda, Yunani, or Chinese medicine, included scientific elements. Similarly, Western medicine was as much art as science. So claiming the mantle of science for one system, but not the other, was an error, according to Dunn. In addition, Dunn favored the term cosmopolitan for its associated meaning of cosmopolitanism. Dunn noted, and I quote, a dictionary definition of cosmopolitan conveys the ideas of worldwide rather than limited or provincial in scope or bearing, involving persons in all or many parts of the world. And so what interested Dunn most was the way that cosmopolitan medicine had achieved global ascendancy, even though the system was developed in the West and was then transplanted to other parts of the world. The rapid globalization of the system of medicine was clearly tied to capitalist expansion in the 20th century. And yet Dunn worried that a particular model of healthcare delivery developed in the capitalist West, primarily for urban areas, with a strong focus on high-tech curative medicine, was probably not adaptive in many other cultural settings. 
Although he noted that the cosmopolitan medical system was not globally hom homogenous, manifesting significant local and regional variation, its transfer to other parts of the world might quickly lead to the subordination or even the demise of local and regional forms. Dunn described cosmopolitan medicine as global, largely urban, with an inherent appeal to scientifically educated secondary elites. Furthermore, cosmopolitan medicine involved processes of professionalization and specialization, which could ultimately us usurp the authority of local healers. Dunn cautioned that the cosmopolitan medical system might have a profound impact in non-Western settings, responding with biologically-based solutions such as vaccines and antibiotics and IVF, when the healthcare problems of the poor were at their root political and economic in nature. So over time, and under the influence of the theories of Michel Foucault, this term cosmopolitan medicine gave way to the term biomedicine, which I think is a reflection of the centrality of Foucaultian biopolitics in Western thought, as well as the increasing importance of the bio in the life sciences and biotechnology industries. And so today the term biomedicine is used almost exclusively by scholars to signify Western biotechnologically based medicine. However, I would argue that Dunn's earlier notion of cosmopolitan medicine signals the global in a way that the Foucauldian term biomedicine does not. What concerned Dunn much more than Foucault, and I'm sure that nobody has ever compared Foucault and Fred Dunn, <laughs> but um, Fred Dunn cared about globalization and hegemony, the eventual hegemony of Western medicine around the world, and I think his concerns were truly prescient. Because four decades on, Western invented, high-tech, urban-based, curative medicine, Dunn's definition of cosmopolitan medicine, has in fact spread far and wide, including to the Middle East. And to just give a few examples, Egypt, which was the site of my earliest research, that's where I started, now boasts 20 Western-style medical schools, almost as many schools of dentistry, and more than 50 IVF clinics, including five that are partially subsidized by the state. And this is Saudi Arabia, this is not Egypt. Saudi Arabia is a sort of latecomer to Western cosmopolitan medicine, but it now surpasses Egypt in the total number of medical colleges. It has 21 medical colleges. And even tiny UAE, with a population of about 9 million, now boasts four medical schools across the country, including one medical school devoted exclusively to the training of female physicians. And so, as I would argue, the UAE, and particularly the Emirate of Dubai, manifests the second distinct feature of medical cosmopolitanism that I'd like to <laughs> emphasize. Namely, the country, the UAE, is the Middle East's most cosmopolitan nation, with Dubai the Middle East's only global city. Of all the cities in the Middle East, Dubai is the only one to have cultivated a reputation as a high-tech global hub for medical treatment and consumption. Indeed, Dubai is now considered one of eight destinations for medical tourism within Asia. Within the Middle East as a whole, Dubai is home to the region's only medicity. This is called a medicity. Called Dubai Healthcare City, this medicity is registered as one of 36 tax-exempt free zones in the UAE. And this is a list that also includes Dubai Silicon Oasis, Dubai Internet City, Dubai Academic City, and Dubai Knowledge Village. Dubai Healthcare City, which was initially developed with oversight by a Harvard University team called Partners Harvard Medical International, is said to include more than 100 medical facilities and more than 3,000 healthcare professionals. Despite some setbacks associated with the economic downturn of 2008-2009, this medicity has nonetheless become a destination point <coughs> for medical travelers from around the world. And it has also served to staunch the flow of wealthy Gulf Arab patients out of the region who in prior years would have traveled abroad for medical treatment to places like Thailand. And I was just, you know, there. I was there in September and it's going strong. Dubai Healthcare City is going strong. <coughs> Dubai Healthcare City is part of a much larger attempt by the Dubai government to create the Middle East's first global techno hub, attracting the biotechnology industry and other high-tech industries to this part of the world. So for example, one free zone is called Dubai Biotech Research Park, <coughs> and it's designed to bring the biotech industry to the UAE. Beginning in 2012, Dubai began hosting an annual Biotechnology World Congress with the stated mission of, and I quote, 
promoting the translational nature of modern biotechnological research and to bring together both young and experienced scientists from all regions of the world to open up avenues for their meaningful collaboration at the regional and global level, unquote. Dubai's attempt to bring biotech to the Arab world, including, I must say, in the midst of so much regional violence, is quite significant. As Jordanian professor Rana Dajani noted in an opinion piece in Nature, in the sort of aftermath of the 2011 Arab uprisings, and I quote her, science is not a high priority for countries that have just rid themselves of dictators. But in the wake of the uprisings and protests, it is natural for researchers in those nations and colleagues abroad to see opportunities <coughs> to improve the generally abysmal state of science in Arab countries, unquote. So these biotech conferences and all of this biotech development in the UAE must be seen in this light. It's really the Emirates attempt to establish techno-scientific leadership on a regional and global level in the aftermath of economic crisis <coughs> and revolution. So cultural cosmopolitanism in the Emirates. I feel like some of you coughing. I have a tickle in my throat, but... <laughs> We'll keep it down. So Dubai's attempt to signal its medical cosmopolitanism at the turn of the 21st century is part and parcel of larger state-sponsored efforts in the Emirates to showcase a particular brand of statecraft called cultural cosmopolitanism. In the 21st century, cultural cosmopolitanism signals a new moral and ethical way of living in an increasingly interconnected and heterogeneous world characterized by geographic detour territorialization, <coughs> cultural pluralism, and hybridity. Cultural cosmopolitanism has been characterized as a style of living in transnational spaces such as Dubai, a willingness to engage in the world with cultural others. Described by some as a kind of globalization from within, as opposed to globalization taking place out there, cultural cosmopolitanism has been called a way of being in the 21st century particularly in global cities such as Dubai. However, Dubai's cosmopolitanism, or the bringing together of diverse constituencies from around the world, has a much longer history. Formerly part of the Trucial States, which was a loose confederation of the seven neighboring emirates, Dubai was known as a cosmopolitan trading hub and a place of Arab, Persian, and Indian hybridity. During its colonial period as a British protectorate, which began in 1892 and ended very recently in 1971, the coastal town of Dubai was the most thriving, trade-friendly free port of the Lower Arab Gulf. As a result of this early openness, large populations of South Asians and Iranians settled in Dubai, many of them middle-class and wealthy merchants. With the founding of the Emirati nation-state on December 2, 1971, the influx of foreigners into the country was heightened by a period, a period of hyper-development, particularly in Dubai, but also in Abu Dhabi, the largest and most petroleum-rich emirate and the nation's new capital. <clears throat> Since then, the UAE has become known as one of the largest migrant-receiving countries in the world, in which Indians and Pakistanis, in particular, have found work as day laborers in the booming construction industry. Today, the nation of seven confederated, confederated emirates is decidedly multinational and multicultural. Of the more than nine million people living in the country as of 2014, only about 13% are Emirati. The largest single group is South Asians, who at approximately 58% of the total population are nearly equally divided between Indians and Pakistanis. And I have a colleague named Neha Bora, who's just written a wonderful book called Impossible Citizens, about the large Indian South Asian population in Dubai, who've lived there for generations in some cases, but still can't get Emirati citizenship. So who else lives in the Emirates? Other Asians and Arabs from many nations, and I would say particularly Lebanon, Syria, Palestine, Egypt, and Sudan, make up about 17% of the country's population. And the remaining 8.5% are primarily Western expatriates, as well as a growing number of migrants from various parts of Africa. And so the only continent not well represented in the Emirates today is South America. And where is Sandra? Shout out to our Mexican colleague. <laughs> Sorry, very few Latinos, okay? Dubai is the Emirates' largest city, with a population of nearly 2 million and more than 70 nationalities represented there. According to most commentators, Dubai is now the Middle East's only cosmopolitan metropolis. No longer dependent on the petroleum industry, Dubai's economy has significantly diversified, 
with main revenues coming from three interrelated sources. First, the global financial services industry, second, a luxury real estate sector, and then finally, the international tourist industry. The tourist industry bears special mention. Not only is tourism the main engine of Dubai's economy, thereby distinguishing Dubai from the other six emirates, but it is also what undergirds the lure of Dubai for medical travelers, who can gain easy access to hotel accommodations and can gener generally receive month-long visitor's visas extendable for up to three months before they're required to exit the country. Given the well-developed tourist infrastructure and the relatively lax criteria for getting a visa, it's not surprising that Dubai was the eighth most visited city in the world in 2012, thereby displacing Rome. And, and Julia, where is our Italian IVF? Right, we have an Italian IVF colleague right here too. So Dubai is more visited now than Rome. And Dubai is at the top of the top 10 destination cities in the Middle East and Africa, according to a Forbes survey. And unfortunately, tourist destinations in the Middle East keep going down, 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 and there are not too many left um, at this point. As a tourist destination, Dubai is famous for its iconic architecture, its star architecture, including the sailboat-shaped Burj Al Arab, which is the world's only seven-star hotel, and the sparkling stalagmite-shaped Burj Khalifa, which is now the world's tallest building. And you can actually take a fast elevator right up to the top, and it's quite spectacular. However, what attracts most tourists to Dubai is the shopping. With more than 70 malls, including the Dubai Mall, which is the world's largest mall, and the Mall of the Emirates with its mind-boggling indoor ski slope, <laughs> Dubai has been called the shopping capital of the Middle East. It is a veritable mecca of consumption, with shoppers coming from around the world and from other countries of the Arab Gulf. Given Dubai's brand as a hub of global tourism and shopping, it's not surprising that in 2012, it was rated the 22nd most expensive city in the world and the most expensive city in the Middle East. Dubai has also been rated as one of the best places to live in the Middle East, and according to the American journalist Thomas Friedman, who's a big fan of Dubai, he says, Dubai is where we should want the Arab world to go, unquote. Now, however, this unabashed enthusiasm for Dubai with its shopping malls is questioned by a host of recent scholars who have pointed to the dark side of Dubai, particularly following the spectacular economic crash of the Emirate in 2008-2009. In his book, Dubai, The Vulnerability of Success, political scientist Christopher Davidson has chronicled a host of recent problems in the Emirate, despite its considerable achievements and successes. First, Davidson challenges the notion that Dubai is cosmopolitan in the same way that our other international cities, for example, London, Hong Kong, New York, or Singapore. Cosmopolitanism in these other cities developed organically, according to Davidson, but in the Emirates, it's been created by state policies of importing workers. As Davidson points out, Emiratis and foreigners rarely intermingle socially. He calls Dubai a place of fragmented ethnic enclaves with a very unbalanced sex ratio caused by a mostly male workforce. In fact, three quarters of Dubai's residents, uh, not citizens, but residents are male. For Emiratis themselves, pictured here, the UAE's ruling bargain provides generous welfare benefits for Emirati citizens at the expense of their political freedoms. In return for the monarch's largesse, Emiratis are expected to be politically quiescent and are harshly punished if they insult the rulers through political activism. In other words, the Emirates' unwritten social contract, which is similar to that found throughout the Gulf monarchies, is political acquiescence in exchange for wealth redistribution. Furthermore, only local Emiratis are automatically entitled to citizenship. It's rare for foreign residents, including members of the large South Asian population, to become naturalized, even in the case of those who were born in the country after their families have resided there for generations. Without citizenship, most foreigners do not own property, renting their accommodations from Emirati nationals, who serve as wealthy landlords. Furthermore, all businesses, including Conceive, opened by non-citizens, <coughs> must have a kafil, or a local sponsor, who, as a sleeping partner, generally does not work in the business, but draws off at least 51% of the profits. Mm -hmm. So as a wealthy rentier elite, Emir Emiratis now face the vulnerability of their extractive system, which comes in the form of what Davidson calls rentier pathologies, or the Dubai paradox. In other words, young Emiratis, especially young men, are generally undereducated in low-quality government schools, are economically unproductive, and are voluntarily unemployed, a kind of slacker generation prone to lassitude and chronic overconsumption. Some of this consumption, furthermore, is religiously illicit. 
Davidson points out that Dubai has become Sin City, a home of alcohol in the midst of a dry region, and a site for gambling, international criminal and terrorist organizations, human trafficking, homosexuality, which is illegal in the Middle East, and sex tourism. Other critics, including anthropologists Ahmed Khanna and Neha Bora, have described Dubai as an ethnocracy, a society governed by an exclusive <coughs> ruling tribal ethnic who view all groups of foreigners as subordinate. In this ethnocracy, Emiratis worry about their cultural integrity, seeing it as threatened. Thus, Emiratis are reluctant to open up to outsiders, worrying that cosmopolitanism has gone too far, too far in Dubai, where 95% of the workforce is made up of foreigners. And I've written about this, some of you know. There's a program called Emiratization that's going on in the UAE to try to get more Emirati nationals into the labor force, in particular into the private labor force. So Emirati scholar Noor al qasimi describes her own nation as indebted and disinherited. The UAE, she argues, has allied itself with what, with what she calls the pan-Gulfian neoliberal bloc that exercises control over the future through capitalist accumulation, for example, in the growth of tourism, shopping malls, and the information technology sector. Yet according to al qasimi the UAE is actually threatened by multiple instabilities. These include climate change and erosion of its land mass, depletion of its oil reserves, a demographic imbalance whereby Emiratis themselves face a state of extinction amid an ever-growing foreign labor force, uprisings of disenfranchised groups, including foreign workers who lack citizenship rights, ethno-sectarian <coughs> revolt from within, the rise of the Muslim Brotherhood and other Islamic insurgent groups, and the threat that monarchical rulers will be unable to ma maintain their sovereignty over time, which is what Davidson has predicted, it predicted in his book called After the Sheikhs. But having said all of this, if aspirations are an inextricable element of globalization, as Henrietta Moore and other globalization theorists have argued, then Dubai still represents an example par excellence of global aspirations on multiple levels. Only after only two and a half decades, Dubai has managed to transform itself from a mostly Bedouin, desert-based sort of economy and society into one of the world's emergent global cities, a cosmopolitan techno hub, unparalleled in any other part of the Muslim Middle East. Having survived the crash of 2008-2009, and having been largely spared from the regional violence, although the UAE is participating with Saudi Arabia and the US, I might add, in an unjustified war on Yemen. Okay, another topic. <laughs> but you don't feel it when you're in Dubai. You don't feel the war in Yemen when you're in Dubai. So Dubai is currently booming, and not with bombs, it's booming, with tourists pouring in from every corner of the planet. And so now to turn to my own study. I met 125 couples from 50 nations, most of them transnationally sophisticated, highly educated, dual career, prospering professional couples who had traveled to Dubai for IVF care in this comfortable cosmopolitan milieu. In general, these infertile couples were connected by their shared outlook on life, a certain cosmopolitan disposition. Thus, I came to think of most of these couples as cosmopolitan repro-travelers who were attracted to Dubai precisely because of its reputation as a growing cosmopolitan repro-hub. And so in my book called Cosmopolitan Conceptions, to describe and understand this flow of infertile cosmopolitan repro-travelers into the repro-hub of Dubai, I formulated a conceptual vocabulary which I call my repro-lexicon. Some of this reprolexicon is unabashedly derivative. I basically stole the terms. I, I was inspired by the terms of other globalization theorists in anthropology, and I've added my own twist to other people's words. However, some of the terms are original, and they're designed, in my view, to capture the dynamics, the directionality, the subjectivities, and the affect associated with 21st century repro travel. And so I'd like to introduce briefly the five key tropes that animate my ethnography, and I want to begin at the meta level and then end with the lived experiences of actual repro travelers whose stories form the core of my ethnography. And I am going to end this talk with a little story of one repro traveler who I call Rania. But to begin, <clears throat> the global reproductive assemblage. In their well-known collection, Global Assemblages, Technology, Politics, and Ethics as Anthropological Problems, Aiwa Ong and Stephen Collier build upon Foucault's and Deleuze's analysis of assemblage to propose the concept of the global assemblage. 
An assemblage, according to Armin Collier, is, and I'll quote, a contingent ensemble of diverse practices and things that is divided along the axes of territoriality and deterritorialization. As a composite concept, the term global assemblage suggests inherent tensions. Global implies broadly encompassing, seamless, and mobile. Assemblage implies heterogeneous, contingent, unstable, partial, and situated. Thus, among the range of phenomena that best re reveal such assemblages are, and again to quote, technoscience, circuits of licit and illicit exchange, systems of administration or governance, and regimes of ethics or values, unquote. So the 21st century movements of infertile couples to IVF clinics around the world could be conceived of quite readily as a kind of global reproductive assemblage. This global reproductive assemblage involves the global diffusion of IVF and its underlying technoscience, international circuits of traveling people and increasingly their body parts, systems of administration involving both the med medical and tourism industries, increasing regulatory governance on the part of both nations and professional bodies, and growing ethical concerns about various forms of licit and illicit exchange, including unprecedented <coughs> evasion of the law across national and international borders. And so all the things that they were talking about, you know, technoscience, circuits of licit and illicit exchange, systems of administration or governance, regimes of ethics or values. You see all of this in this global world of IVF, the industry, the science, and the sort of movements around it. And so that's what I was thinking of in terms of a global reproductive assemblage. It brings together many diverse elements that have to operate together on a global scale to make IVF happen around the world and the associated mobilities of IVF, a sort of distinct form of travel in the 21st century. So the ensemble, the assemblage is the ensemble of all these parts working in the global world today, the sort of global IVF industry, if you would. But before the concept of global assemblages was introduced into academic discourse, the anthropologist Arjun Apadurai had already put forth his influential notion of scapes. In the mid-1990s, he outlined a global cultural economy and imagined world in which global movements operate through five pathways. According to Apadurai, globalization is characterized by the movement of ethnoscapes, or people, technoscapes, or technology, Financescapes, or money, capital, mediascapes, or images, and ideascapes, or ideas, <clears throat> which now follow increasingly complex trajectories moving at different speeds across the globe. So, a Potterized very dynamic notion of these moving scapes remains extremely provocative for thinking about repro travel. For this form of global movement clearly entails two of a Potterized five scapes, namely ethnoscapes and technoscapes. Ethnoscapes, according to Apaderai, involve, and I'll quote, the landscape of persons who constitute the shifting world in which we live, tourists, immigrants, refugees, exiles, guest workers, and other moving groups and individuals. Technoscapes, he said, involve, and I quote, the global configuration, also ever fluid, of technology and the fact that technology, both high and low, both mechanical and informational, now moves at high speeds across various kinds of previously impervious boundaries." Unquote. So the consideration of global repro travel has the potential to expand a potterized theory of scapes. One scape of significant medical anthropological interest, namely the bioscape of moving biological substances, such as blood and semen, and body parts, such as gametes and organs, might be added to a potterized list. Using the Potterized language, language of scapes, global travel for IVF might also be thought of as a more complex reproscape, a kind of metascape combining numerous dimensions of globalization and global flows. That is, repro travel occurs in a new world order characterized not only by circulating reproductive technologies, but also circulating reproductive actors and their gametes, their egg and sperm leading to a large-scale global industry in which images and ideas about making lovely test tube babies while on vacation come into play. This reproscape entails a discernible geography in which global flows are also moving in particular directions, which may become quite regularized over time. So for example, egg donors and recipients now head to Spain and parts of Eastern Europe, while couples seeking surrogacy Travel to California in the US and, and Asia it used to be India was the global repro hub for commercial gestational surrogacy, um, but I think things have changed subtly um, since then. 
And those needing sperm, where's the global repro hub for sperm donation? Denmark. 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 Everybody in this room knows. <laughs> if I ask other audiences, they all look at me. <laughs> they get really surprised if it's Denmark, especially if I'm talking in Europe. They all go, well, we don't know what we think about that. But yes, Denmark has what's the sort of robust industry of sperm donation, and they send it all over the world, that Danish Viking sperm. <laughs> now, the Middle Eastern reproscape also entails a distinct geography traversed by global flows of reproductive actors, technologies and their body parts. Indeed, Dubai, I would argue, is the center of a regional reproscape in which couples are heading into the Emirate from Western Europe, from South Asia, from East and West Africa, and other parts of the Middle East. In short, a reproscape, as I'm thinking of it, is both spatial and dynamic. It involves geography and movement. Whereas the global reproductive assemblage entails a kind of coming together of diverse IVF elements, the notion of reproscape is more dynamic, entailing movements of many kinds. However, these movements are not unfettered. The adjective stratified may be added to the term reproscape to describe the inequalities, disjunctures, and obstacles that inhibit and even prevent flows of people, technology, and other forms across uneven global terrains. And to take but one example from my work there, in Dubai, elites from the Horn of Africa may come to the Emirates to undergo a single cycle of IVF, but the vast majority of infertile sub-Saharan sub African couples coming from places like Somalia and Djibouti will never take part in these repro flows to Dubai. In other words, the stratified reproscape in which reproductive travel takes place is an uneven terrain, since some individuals, some communities, and some nations have achieved greater access to the fruits of reproductive globalization than others. Furthermore, this reproscape is highly gendered, and this is a feature of globalization that was not part of the focus of a Potterized original work on global scapes. For example, the global reproscape entails new forms of gendered reproductive labor <coughs> among reproductive assistants, most of whom are women, who undergo risky forms of hormonal stimulation, egg harvesting, pregnancy, and labor. These variable measures of reproductive value are clear indicators of the stratified reproscape in which some reproductive bodies are valued more than others. <clears throat> Reproflows. I propose the concept of reproflows to bring these bodies and body parts back into the discussion of IVF as a global form. If a reproscape entails the geography and directionality of reproductive movements in space and time, then within each reproscape there are specific types of flows that are entirely unique to the world of IVF. The term reproflows alludes to embodied movements of many kinds, flows of reproductive actors, reproductive technologies, and reproductive substances, as well as the mechanical and physiological movements of reproductive bodies themselves, which are required for the processes of assisted conception. On one level, reproflows involve the movement of many kinds of human actors. These include the IVF scientists, physicians, embryologists, and other kinds of IVF technicians who travel to and from sites of training, international conferences, and medical trade shows, and to the countries and clinics where they provide their services. Among these reproductive actors are embryo couriers who cross international borders, carrying their precious cargoes in carefully sealed cryopreservation tanks. Reproflows also involve the thousands upon thousands, perhaps millions, of men and women now flowing across national and international borders in their search for IVF technologies and related forms of reproductive assistance. Reproflows also include the reproductive assistants, including traveling gamete donors and surrogates who may be flown across international borders in increasingly regularized circuits of reproductive exchange. On another level, reproflows also engage non-human actors, which are crucial elements in the global reproscape. Reproflows repro involve the movement of IVF technologies from sites where they were developed, for example, England in the case of IVF, Belgium in the case of ICSI, to many other countries around the world, flows that are made possible through processes of manufacture in countries such as the US and Italy, and global dispersion via medical trade shows and pharmaceutical representatives. Reproflows also involve many kinds of reproductive entities and substances, including the embryos passed from country to country, the frozen sperm samples ready for use in donor insemination, which are posted through various international delivery services, and the reproductive hormones or the costly medications used to stimulate women's ovaries into oocyte hyperproduction. 
And finally, in the domain of reproductive physiology, reproflows speak to the quintessentially fluid nature of men's and women's bodies and to the biological movements of conception that take place every minute in IVF clinics and laboratories around the world. For example, reproflows entail the flow of semen into plastic cups in IVF clinic bathrooms as men are asked to masturbate themselves to ejaculation or to be masturbated by their wives. Reproflows include the flow of oocytes suctioned from women's ovaries and flushed from pipettes into waiting petri dishes in IVF laboratories, where they're handled and inspected by embryologists. Reproflows also involve the aspiration of semen <coughs> for men's reproductive tracts in the hopes of finding viable spermatozoa for the purposes of AC <coughs> injection. And reproflows involve the flow of menstrual blood when conception is not achieved during a failed IVF cycle. Reproflows speak to a world of moving technologies, bodies, gametes, embryos, and other reproductive substances, the very material and biological <coughs> substrate upon which this, the reproscape is founded. However, flows of bodies and body parts do not always occur in an unfettered fashion. In the world of assisted reproduction, bodily flows are often blocked, hindered, or rendered inert. For example, reproductive hormones are injected without stimulating the maturation of eggs. Semen is ejaculated without yielding viable spermatozoa. Eggs are fertilized with sperm but do not become human embryos. Embryos are transferred into wombs but are not implanted in uterine walls. Pregnancy tests are positive but lead to negative outcomes such as stillbirths and miscarriages. In short, biologically based reproductive constraints of many kinds continue to plague the embodied world of IVF, making IVF fail more often than not thus seriously demoralizing those who have traveled to use it. <clears throat> but biological obstacles are not the only deterrent to IVF successes. Indeed, there are numerous other arenas of constraint, structural, sociocultural, ideological, and practical obstacles and apprehensions that may detract or deter IVF seekers from accessing assisted reproductive technologies within their home countries. So, <clears throat> On a global level, the two most fundamental arenas of constraint are probably economic and legal. That is, IVF seekers may not be able to afford these services in their home countries, or they may be barred from accessing IVF services because of various legal prohibitions. However, it's important to emphasize that economics and law are not the only arenas of reproductive constraint. Instead, a complex set of factors militates against access to IVF, thus setting in motion repro travel across national and international borders. And these arenas of reproductive constraint can be grouped into four broad categories, namely resource considerations, including the high costs of IVF, for example, in the US right now, the average cycle of IVF costs, and we don't have subsidized IVF in most parts of the US, it costs 12,500 US dollars to do one cycle of IVF, and to make a test tube baby in the US costs more than 60,000 US dollars. And it means that a very small percentage of Americans, something like 15%, have good, effective access to IVF because it's simply so expensive. So, cost. Then there are parts of the world where there really are no IVF clinics, including many countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. So no clinics, no equipment, no physicians, no resources, waiting lists, and so on. So those are the resource considerations. Legal and religious <coughs> prohibitions are widely found, especially in Europe. Europe is the most legislated part of the world in terms of ART legislation. But in the Muslim world where I work, there are religious bans and sort of bioethically agreed upon Islamic mandates about what you can and can't do. And also I should say that because of these sort of ethical, religious, legal prohibitions, there are many categories of people who can't get access to IVF. And this often includes people who are not married, so single people, and gay couples who can't get access for those reasons. Then there are quality and safety concerns, which are understudied, under-talked about in the world of ART. But these are things like very poor quality IVF care, unsafe practices in some clinics, and low success rates. And then finally, there are the sociocultural issues that revolve around issues of privacy and confidentiality, not wanting your family to know that you're doing this, cultural and linguistic barriers, the lack of supportive services, wanting to feel <coughs> a place of comfort in order to do IVF. So in general, the repro travelers that I met often said that they felt forced to travel from their home countries in order to access IVF services that were safe, effective, legal, and affordable. And so those are the four big issues that are sort of pushing people across borders. 
And so all of these issues are best exemplified through stories of actual repro travelers. And during the course of my research in the Emirates, I collected 125 repro travel stories, some from men, others from women, but mostly from repro traveling couples who spoke with me together in what I would like to call a rather uncommon form of marital ethnography. We anthropologists tend to work with women if we're women, men if we're men, and we rarely talk to men and women together, especially when they're married. And it's very interesting to talk to married people together. The banter is very interesting. So I did that. And throughout my book, I attempt to feature these repro travelers' voices and their repro travel stories as much as possible, beginning with the story in the prologue of a woman who I call Rania. And I interviewed her alone, and not with her husband, though I met him. Rania was not the typical repro traveler to Dubai. She was a working class African refugee living in the United Kingdom. She had exhausted the possibilities for IVF in the UK, including the free cycles of IVF offered through the National Health Service, or NHS. Rania was one of several repro travelers in my study who I came to think of as the NHS refugees. These were infertile people residing in the UK, they were citizens of the UK, who felt forced out of the NHS by virtue of its rationing system, and especially the postcode lottery. I did not know what a postcode lottery was until I went to Dubai and learned that if you don't live in the right postcode, the right zip code, we would call it, you may not have access to any free cycles of IVF. It very much depends on what jurisdiction you live in. And so people were very frustrated that they didn't live in the right place to get access to cycles of subsidized IVF. So Rania did, she had used the NHS services, um, but she had other issues, many other issues. And so her long narrative, which opens my book, which she poured out to me, I mean literally poured out to me, it typifies her frustrations with IVF services in the UK. More importantly, however, it signals her ardent desires for children and the incredible lengths to which many infertile people will go in order to access safe and effective reproductive services outside of their home countries. Her story is lengthy and tortuous and torturous. I published it as a verbatim transcription in the prologue to the book. And so I'm not going to read that, but let, I'm going to end here with a little synopsis of Rania's repro travel story. So Rania was an Eritrean Ethiopian Muslim woman who was grateful to the UK for taking her in as a teenage refugee. Rania and her Sudanese refugee husband, Ahmed, had become British citizens. Yet Rania and Ahmed's path to reproduction in Britain was anything but straightforward. Eight cycles of in vitro fertilization in the UK led to the birth of only one child, a daughter named Wisal. And I should say she used both <coughs> private and public IVF. She was sort of going back and forth in the UK. So she had had one IVF daughter, a little girl. Feeling desperate to provide Wissal with a sibling, Rania began a global search to find a trustworthy IVF clinic. Her journey, uh, journey eventually led her to Dubai, which she perceived to be the Middle East's most cosmopolitan city. And she wanted to be in a place that was Muslim. She wanted to go to a Muslim country. There, Rania was lucky to find Conceive. Yet, it was in Conceive that Rania almost died due to a dangerous reproductive tract infection that was lingering in her swollen fallopian tube. Once the infectious agent was released into her bloodstream via IVF, Rania developed a life-threatening infection, which Dr. Pankaj managed to cure with intravenous antibiotics. The toxicity of the pelvic infection caused Rania's eighth IVF attempt to fail, and that's where the story ended in the autumn of 2007. She miraculously, she got over us, almost sepsis. She was really sick and conceived. Dr. Pankaj got her stabilized, sent her back home, and he told her that she needed to do something in the British NHS. She, she was a woman of steely determination. She followed Dr. Pankaj's advice to return to the NHS, and there she had the infected fallopian tube removed through a government-subsidized laparoscopic surgery. This surgery left her ovary intact, thus she was able to return to conceive to undergo her ninth attempted IVF cycle there. Happily, Rania became pregnant with an IVF daughter who was delivered in the UK in 2010. Still wanting to bear a son for her husband, Ahmed, Rania returned to conceive in 2011, delivering a male IVF child nine months later. Buoyed by this final experience of two rapid IVF successes, Rania returned to conceive again in 2012, becoming pregnant with another male child. However, after returning to London, Rania went into premature labor at 20 weeks of gestation, delivering an extremely premature infant who did not survive his untimely delivery. 
At the age of 44, Rania decided to return to conceive one last time. Having undertaken 12 attempts at assisted conception, eight in London and four in Dubai, Rania hoped that her last IVF sojourn would allow her to beat the odds to make the impossible possible, as she was fond of saying. At Conceive, Rania produced enough eggs to create two viable IVF embryos, which were transferred into her womb in early 2014. Following the embryo transfer, Rania returned to London and was not heard from again. The assumption on the part of Conceive staff was that Rania's 13th IVF cycle had been unlucky, it's an unlucky number, and that she had therefore been unable to replace her lost IVF son. And that's true, I just confirmed in going back to Dubai that that was it. She had the three kids and that was it. She didn't come back, but she had three children. So when compared to many others, Rania could be considered quite lucky. Through assisted reproduction, she had been able to become a mother of three children, two daughters, and one son, thereby triumphing over her infertility and her social and embodied suffering. Rania hoped that I would publish her story someday so that others might learn from her reproductive trials and tribulations, yet be inspired by her triumphant spirit. And so with this sense of moral responsibility and obligation to Rania and to the many other repro travelers who I met in Dubai, I do my best in the pages of this book, Cosmopolitan Conceptions, to bring their stories to life. Thank you.